Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Church. We are glad that you are here with us. We invite you to stand as we begin our time of corporately worshiping together, lifting our voices before the Lord, declaring these truths. Our Father everlasting, the all creating God Almighty. Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection. brought us these truths for the very first time and thank you for the gift of music that we could apply these truths into them secure them in our hearts to worship and to praise you we do pray this in your name amen before you're seated take a moment to greet somebody that's around you Good morning and welcome to Grace Church. 
If you're here in person or watching online, we are so glad that you joined us. If you're visiting, we invite you to go out to the Welcome Center and meet some volunteers and staff who will gladly answer any questions that you might have. As always, if you'd like to pray with someone, there will be people up front after the service ready to pray and talk with you. Here are some of the events, activities, and classes coming up at Grace. Morning, fall is officially here and it's time to start planning for our annual uh, outreach event called the Harvest Party. If you've never been, I just wanna give you a little glimpse of what it's all about. We remove the chairs from the sanctuary and bring in tons of games and activities for the kids. Families have a safe place to dress up, have fun, and fellowship with others from our community. Every carnival style booth is handing out candy and there are plenty of refreshments to go around as well. And of course, we throw in a little friendly competition. As you can imagine, this event takes a small army to pull it all off. Uh, in your bulletin this morning, there is an insert that has all the different ways that you can get involved from hosting a booth, to providing food, parking, all kinds of things. So take a look at your insert, uh, fill that out. You can hand it into the Welcome Center or check out the website and you can sign up there as well. We're hoping you and your family can join us as well as bring your uh, friends and neighbors as well. This is a great time to show them what our church is all about. Thanks. September and October are just about the best thing that New England has to offer. Wonderful weather outside, being able to get together we are just so grateful to Peter and Shelly Mitchell who open up their farm to us every single year for a hayride. So put it on your calendar October 8th after the second service. We come over, we pack a picnic lunch, we have that here, and then there's a hayride around the farm. It's a great opportunity to get to know some people that you may not already know and just a great time to be together. So put it on your calendar October 8th. We'll see you there. Our mission at Grace Church is to know Christ and to make him known. Well, this happens in many different ways, and you are always welcome to join us in that task. This is what's happening at Grace. I'd like to invite you to stand with us as we lift our voices and prepare for communion this morning. Thank you, God, for the death that he sacrificed on the cross in our place, offering forgiveness and freedom from our sin.
our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But when Jesus rose,
Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. It is not lost on me that the songs that we just sung may be singing of things that are foreign to you. And it is not lost on me that the songs that we have just sung mention things that are all too familiar. I know that in this room right now, there are people wrestling with depression and fear and anxiety, and maybe you have never heard those words linked to the words hope and peace and life, but I'm here to tell you today that because of the song we sang before that, because death was arrested, there is peace and there is hope for whatever you are going through today. Those things do not identify you. Hopefully, you are a child of the king, and if that's not the case, it can happen right now. Jesus loves you. This is what we've just been singing about, and he died for you to pay the debt of your, of your sin that you wouldn't have to pay. That's why we come here and celebrate in such boisterous songs, and we can sing about death and celebration because of what it has done for us. But if you have never known that kind of peace, and hope, and freedom. It is available to not just today, but right now. You can come to Christ in humility and say, Father, whatever we just sang about, it resonated with me. And I realize now that I need you as my Savior. It's as simple as that. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, in all of our lives, we want to be people who exalt you. But even as we gather this morning, Father, we want to recognize and exalt you truly for who you are. You were the creator of all things visible and invisible, of planets and stars and galaxies and the wonders that stagger our imaginations, of the power of tropical storms and the peace of a summer evening, the blazing autumn colors and cold winter nights of babies and birthdays, friends and families, and all things that reveal your glory. And we exalt you for being the king of kings who rules over every molecule of space in this universe and every second of time in history to bring about your good purposes. 
You care and command everything in your creation. You reign over all things in absolute wisdom and power, majesty and love. And you have compassion on all who have made and satis- you have made and satisfied the desire of every living thing. We exalt you for being the judge over the living and the dead. You are the Holy One of whom every person will give an account for their lives. You judge not only our actions, but our intentions of heart by your holy word. You will give to people according to their works. You will give eternal life to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. You will give wrath and tribulation and distress to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth. And we exalt you for being the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. You show compassion on your own children. You know our frame and remember that we are but dust. You forgive all our sins because of Jesus' death and resurrection. And you give us each day our daily bread and provide for all of our needs. And you give good gifts to your children, especially the Holy Spirit, to those who ask. And for all of these blessings and countless more, we give you praise in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It is the first Sunday of the month, and it is our routine here at Grace to take time in our service to celebrate the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a unique meal in that it remembers the death of our Lord Jesus Christ and all that it accomplished for us. I'd like to turn our attention just for a minute or two to Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, and it reads like this. When you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing them over the cross. This passage is very clear that we bring one thing to this relationship, the death in our sins. The one thing that we bring in the many things provided for us in Christ. He was the one who forgave our sins. He was the one who canceled the the charge of our legal indebtedness. And he was the one who made a spectacle of the evil powers of this world by going to the cross. For the evil one, the cross is one giant checkmate. There still be made moves to make, but the outcome has been determined. Martin Luther, the great theologian, also wrote one of the more popular, famous hymns of our time, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And one of the verses reads as this, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure. For lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Do you ever wonder what that word is? It's one word in Greek, tetelestai. In English, it's actually three words. It is finished. In the moment that Jesus was on the cross and cried out, It is finished. All that was needed for our atonement, all that was needed for our restoration to the Father was accomplished in that moment. We bring absolutely nothing more. And that is what this meal celebrates. I invite the gentlemen to come forward as we pass out these elements. I mentioned before that hopefully you are a child of God, and if you aren't in this moment, you could take play of this. But what I would suggest is if you 
aren't really sure where you stand with God. Maybe you're just kind of kicking the tires on this idea of faith or even who Jesus is. I would just ask you maybe to let the elements go by. This really is a family time. For those that are followers of Jesus Christ who are covered by his blood, please ponder anew these elements and what Christ has done on your behalf.
cross stands there by itself is nothing but an instrument of torture and death. But when Jesus is on that cross, it is a pathway to peace. And it's only because of him and what he did for us. This cracker represents his body that he sacrificed for you and for me. Take and eat in remembrance of him. This cup, likewise, represents the blood that Jesus shed on that very cross. The blood where scripture tells us without the shedding, there would be no remission of sin. Take this, drink in remembrance of him. Father, we do thank you for the obedience of Jesus coming to this earth. First as a baby, living a perfect life, and then going to the cross as a sinless man, paying our debt, the debt of sinners. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for the proclamation of it. For Pastor Eric, as he comes in a few moments, give him courage and clarity. Open our eyes and ears that we would hear from you this morning. And we do pray this in your name. Amen. First John two fifteen to twenty nine. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, it is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, So now many antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that we, that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it, was has, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Thanks, Heath. Good morning, church. For those who don't know me, my name is Eric Garbidson. It's an honor to serve as one of your pastors here at Grace. I want to start this morning by introducing you to somebody. Uh, This little guy is called a Barbary macaque monkey. He's native to North African and Asian countries. Now, he's mainly a vegetarian, but some of his close relatives will pop an insect for a snack from time to time. They like to live close to human villages and dwellings and can be found often raiding crops like wheat, rice, sugarcane, melons, and other fruit. So basically, he's a little thief, but boy, is he cute. Well, I recently read of an interesting method used by farmers to catch these little crooks to keep them out of their gardens. A farmer hollows out a gourd and makes a hole in it large enough for the monkey to insert his open hand. The gourd is then filled with food and tied to a tree. The curious monkey is attracted by the smell of the food and reaches inside and grabs it. But then the hole 
is too big or is too small for his clenched fist to come out of as long as he's holding on to the snack inside. Because he refuses to release the prize, the monkey traps himself. He desires what he's grasping so much that he's unaware of the fact that it's, he's now captured by it and now controls him. Even though the snack is a good thing, because of his pride, it turns out to be a trap. In our passage this morning, the Apostle John outlines for us how we are like monkeys. Now, I'm not talking about how people claim we're descendants of monkeys, but how we, like the monkey, can easily be so intent on grasping at what the world offers us that we miss the joy of abiding in Christ. The book of 1 John is a book about fellowship and relationships. Earlier in the chapter, John discusses who believers are to love, God and Christians. And now he's turning his reader's attention to what not to love, the world and the lies of false teachers. By doing this, we're abiding in Christ as we eagerly await his return. Today we're in the book of 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through the end of the chapter, verse 29. If you haven't yet opened your Bibles to that, I invite you to do so. And if you didn't bring a Bible or have a device with a Bible app in front of you, that's okay. Uh, Underneath the seat in front of you, you should be able to find a blue pew Bible. Feel free to grab one of those. Let's take a moment, quiet our hearts, and dedicate this time in God's word to him. Please pray with me. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it, it is all we need to know you more and to live a life of godliness. Lord, may the words that come from it this morning shape in our hearts, help us to hear you afresh. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the main theme of the book of 1 John is Christian fellowship and community. How we interact in our fellowship with God impacts our fellowship with believers. The vertical sets the precedence for the horizontal. In fact, we can't have horizontal Christian fellowships and relationships if we're not first seeking healthy and growing vertical relationship and fellowship with God. Chapter 1 explains how we're to live a Christian life by being in fellowship with God and in fellowship with each other. And then in the first part of chapter 2, the apostle's objective is to provide us with the assurance of salvation through the experiential knowledge of knowing Jesus. Not just knowing of him, but knowing him personally through the sacrifice that he made for us. This then lays the foundation for the rest of the book by expressing why we needed a savior someone who can come and rescue us from the separation of God that our sin creates in us. And then he defines for us the Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, fully God and fully man, who lived and came and, and lived just as we do, only he was without sin. He never sinned once. And because of that, he had to be the one to die as the propitiation or the atoning sacrifice. It took the perfectly righteous to be sacrificed in order to make righteous the woefully unrighteous. And now if we believe that, when we sin, we have an advocate in Christ who sits by the Father, And then as we grow in our relationship with God, our desire to be in fellowship with others also grows. And now we see John moving from explaining why we need Jesus to warning us about the things that redirect or distract us from following Jesus. Here John gives us two distractions that vie for our attention and try to move our eyes off of Christ. They're Number one, the world, and number two, false teaching. And then he shares with us the, us the result of choosing those distractions, not being prepared for when Christ returns. 
just like the monkey sticks his hand in the gourd and refuses to let go, it's so easy for us to get so focused on an idea, a desire, or a success that we make that thing big and we make God small. But if we follow John's teachings here, we have the ability to learn that abiding in Christ's truth keeps you from loving the world. Please read, starting at verse 15 with me. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. The first distraction that John warns us about is loving the world and all that it can provide us. Now, I think we should first begin by defining what he means by the world. John's not talking here about the physical world, God's creation. In fact, we see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, that we're called to love the world, steward it, and, and subdue it, and take care of it. What he means here is worldliness, which is defined for us as anything whose values, beliefs, and morals are in distinction and rebellion to God's. Worldliness is anything that causes you to lose enjoyment in the Father's love and keeps you from doing the Father's will. Worldliness is often used in Scripture in comparison to godliness. Worldliness versus godliness. And when we're in worldliness, then our desires and our passions will be driven by our worldliness. In verse 16, he defines for us what the worldly passions are. He defines them as the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, I want to take a moment and break these down because these were not just for the readers that, wrote, that, lit, that read this early on, but they're completely applicable for us today. The desires of the flesh are any desire that battles against the Spirit in us. A few weeks ago, Pastor Lou shared with us and taught us about our old self, who we are before salvation when we were ruled by our sin nature. And then our new self, who we are after we're saved by Christ and when we're slowly shedding our sin nature and clinging to the divine nature. Now, even though we have this new divine nature, our sin still wages war against that divine nature. Well, our old self is the flesh that we're talking about. So our fleshly desires are the desires that we have in our sin. You know, an interesting thing about the desires of the flesh is that God has given man innate desires that are good. Not all desires are inherently sinful. For example, hunger, thirst, rest, and physical intimacy are all good things given to us by God. But when the flesh controls them, they move from desires to lusts. I mean, hunger isn't a sin, but gluttony is. Thirst isn't sinful, but drunkenness is. Rest isn't sinful, but laziness is. Sex is a precious gift from God when expressed in its intended place within a monogamous marriage between one man and one woman who were born as a man and a woman. When this is warped, then it becomes immorality. This is how the world and our sin traps us by taking a good desire and tempting us to turn it into a bad God to worship. What sorts of things are you desiring in your flesh? What things that the world deems to be necessary and important are you clinging to just a little bit too tightly, like your hand is stuck in a gourd? Now, the desires of the eyes are similar to the desires of the flesh, but they operate in a more refined way. These desires are pleasures that gratify both the sight and the mind. Now, 
They include the obvious example of what we can imagine, our overconsumption of social media, websites, TV shows, movies that contain things in them that we shouldn't watch, but we choose to anyway. But it also extends farther than that. It's also intellectual because our eyes feed our minds. One thing that the world challenges us to do is to question everything and determine whether or not it is true for us. As Christians, we need to be careful not to let intellectualism crowd out the truth of God's word. Sometimes there's a temptation for Christians to worship their knowledge of God instead of actually worshiping God. They know much about God, but do they truly know him and enjoy him? Do they abide in him? In my last sermon, at the beginning of chapter two, I discussed the difference between a head understanding of the knowledge of knowing God and the experiential understanding of knowing God. Gaining knowledge of God is not a sin. It's a good thing that we're actually called to pursue as believers in Christ. But when knowledge alone becomes a person's faith, then their intellect is what they serve, not God. God desires us to experience him and know him, to benefit from having a relational understanding that Christ died for us so that we can be in community with God. When our eyes lead us to feast on things of the world, then our eyes are not on God, but they're on that thing. And when that happens, we lose our ability to abide in him. What sorts of things are your eyes feasting on? When you're not here on a Sunday morning and, we're, and you're left to your own thoughts, what are you pondering and thinking about? What are you putting into your mind? And then there's the pride of life. This is the desire to be seen in a particular way that promotes yourself, not God. God alone is worthy of praise, not us. We don't actually do anything that deserves praise. If we seem to do something good at all, it's because God ordained that to be. The credit is not ours, it's his. So when you do something that seems to be good, are you looking for your ego to get itched? See, many Christians disguise their desire to be recognized for their gifts and abilities as service to God. Are you doing this, though, for God, or are you doing it for you? This is the pride of life. This is not from God, but it's of the world. A really good example of this, these three passions, is actually found in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, where we read the story of the temptation of Eve in the Garden of Eden. Eve is tempted by the serpent, to disobey God and eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She was tempted to desire this fruit of the tree in three ways. First, the fruit seemed pleasing to the appetite. This is the desire of the flesh. The fruit also looked ripe and juicy and delicious. This is the desire of the eyes. And then thirdly, Eve perceived that this fruit would give her the wisdom that God has. This is the pride of life. And because she gave in to these passions, now our world is very different than it was back then. Things changed from innocent and beautiful to sinful and dirty. The world changed from eternal to temporary. And we change from sinless and pure to sinful and in need of a savior to make it right again. John continues to express that all of these pursuits, the desires of the flesh, the eyes, and the pride of life, all end in destruction because the world is temporary. Only God lasts forever. So how do we want to live? Do we want to live for eternity? Or do we want to live for what's temporary? The will of God is for believers to seek eternity and to find joy in eternal things, not the temporary satisfactions that ultimately lead to countless emptiness. 
If the things of the world will pass away, then why do we let them rob our affections for Christ? Recently, I experienced the need to purchase a car. Now, there's nothing wrong with this. Uh, we need cars to be able to get from A to B, to go to work, and to, to bring kids to various appointments and whatnot. But I found myself living in the temporary as I became engros- engrossed in the car selection process. It became what I thought about, talked about, and how I spent my time. See, I wanted to get the best bang for my buck, and Carvana and car gurus are not helpful with that process. But then I realized that I needed to die to my control and trust in God's timing. When I fixed my eyes on him, he satisfied my need. And my obsession turned from, and my my desire turned from obsession to trust, whether I had a car or not. Thankfully, he did provide a nice, reliable car for uh, our family. But when we're stuck in the vicious cycle of pursuing worldly passions that please the longings of our heart, then we're not in tune to the Holy Spirit who is indwelt in us. And we're subjected to believing whatever is thrown at us instead. This happened to Eve, and it can happen to us today. By living to do the will of God, we're abiding in him, which helps us to discern what is true and what is false. And we see in our text next that abiding in Christ's truth protects you from believing lies. Let's continue reading in verse 18. Children, it's the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be complained that they are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will be able to will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. So the first part of the passage describes one way that sin infiltrates and distracts. But now John is describing another way. When we get so fixated on the world, we start to believe what the world tells us is truth. See, a group of false teachers infiltrated the the early church and caused some of its followers to leave. These members of their fellowship, whether they were the false teachers themselves or those that bought into the lies, went out from among them and abandoned the church. In verse 19, John uses some pretty strong language when he says that because they abandoned the church, they never were really part of the church. They may have attended and participated, but they never fully converted. Now, theologically speaking, they were part of the visible church, but not part of the invisible church. The visible church being those of us sitting in this room today. The invisible church being those whose hearts and minds and souls are striving after him. Who have given all of their selves to God. Well, how does John know this? Well, he says that if they were truly part of the invisible church, then they would have stayed in the invisible church. Meaning that they wouldn't have walked away from the truth and believed lies. Because 
True believers persevere in the faith. And true believers remain in the faith. Well, why do we persevere? Why do we remain? Because we have a hope in the promise that Christ will return to earth and take his people with him back to heaven. In verse 18, John explains that we're living in the last hour. Well, what does he mean by this? He means that after Christ's resurrection and ascension, we entered the end times. Christ could come back at any time. And the threatening nature of those who oppose God continues to become more and more intense, which is why John mentions in this section, Antichrist. Now, he is referring to the Antichrist, the one who will come to power at the end of days, but he's also talking about other Antichrists. The prefix anti actually has two meanings in the Greek. It could mean against Christ, or it could also mean instead of Christ. Antichrists may not visibly oppose or wage war against God, but they're anything that people follow instead of God. This is why it's so important for the church to know what it believes and why it believes it, so that we're able to distinguish when there is an antichrist that comes around. One of the truths that the church believes and has been the foundation of the church from the very beginning is that Jesus is the Son of God who came as Savior of the world. But this truth is exactly what those false teachers were attacking in the church of John's day. They rejected the father and son relationship as well as the godness of Jesus. John's exhortation of believers is that you already know the truth of who Jesus is or else you wouldn't be a Christian. So stop listening to the lies that are trying to tell you otherwise. Anyone can claim that Jesus existed. Even the demons did that in Mark chapter 1. Being a true Christ follower actually involves following Christ. If you don't follow the Christ of the Bible, then you're not a Christian. He then reminds his readers that they and we have a protector who protects us from those who try to deceive us. He explains it as the anointing, which we know to be the Holy Spirit indwelt in us. The Holy Spirit is the one who enlightens us to the truth of God through the Bible and convicts us in discernment of what is right and what is wrong. One of the Holy Spirit's roles in our lives is to point us to Jesus, the real Jesus, the true Jesus. If you're pointed to a Jesus that's contrary to how Scripture tells us Jesus is, then you're not being guided by the Holy Spirit. You're being guided by something else. A missionary to the American Indians was in Los Angeles with an Indian friend who was a new Christian. As they walked down the street, they passed a man on the corner who was preaching with a Bible in his hand. Now, the missionary knew that the man represented a cult, but the Indian only saw the Bible and wanted to stop and listen to the sermon. I hope my friend doesn't get confused, the missionary thought to himself, and he began to pray. In a few minutes, the Indian turned away from the meeting and joined his missionary friend. Well, what did you think of the preacher? The missionary asked. All the time he was talking, exclaimed his friend. Something in my heart kept saying, liar, liar. That something in his heart was someone, the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit guides us into the truth that helps us to recognize error. This anointing of God is no lie because the Spirit is truth. To abide means to remain in fellowship. And we are to abide in the Spirit of truth, meaning that we're to abide in the the truth that the Spirit of God gives us. And he does that mainly through God's Word, the Bible. By doing this, we reject what the world entices us with, and we're protected from false teaching. And the result of that is that we're able to be ready for when Christ does come back to rescue his people. Because we see here in our section that abiding in Christ's truth prepares you 
for his return. Please read along with me, starting in verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. As I stated earlier, one of the main purposes of this letter is to teach on fellowship. But now we're seeing John add an element to what our fellowship looks like. John writes here about our sonship, or our being born of God. As true Christians, we're sons and daughters of God, adopted into God's family through the work of Jesus Christ. I mean, how cool is that? When we think of adoption, we think of how a family takes someone who is not previously part of their family and grafts them in like they've been part of them the entire time. And then when you're part of a healthy family, you desire to get to know one another and spend time together. As part of God's family, we desire to know him and obey him. And we look forward to when Christ comes back and brings us all back home. Christ is coming back. He promised us that he would. But I think the question that we have to ask is what will our reaction be when he does come back? Here John explains to us two reactions that a person will have when Christ comes back. Those who remain and abide in him will have confidence through the Holy Spirit. And those who don't abide in him will shrink back in shame when he comes. This is a call to perseverance as a believer. Press on. Hold fast to what is true. Because he's coming back. We will stand before him in the end, but I guess the question is, what will that be like for you? Here's an interesting fact. Did you know that, a, that dolphins sleep with one eye open? It's true. They do so because they can only ever let one side of their brain sleep at a time. So when the left side of the brain sleeps, the right eye will close and vice versa. Now, this isn't some weird ambidextrous stunt that the dolphin does. Rather, it's because they must always remain partially conscious to remind themselves to breathe. Dolphins, unlike most sea creatures, are not fish. They're mammals. So they need to surface regularly to take in air. And for dolphins, breathing is not automatic or reflexive like it is for us humans. In other words, dolphins have to actively decide when to breathe. They alternate which half of their brain is sleeping periodically in order to get the rest they need without ever losing consciousness. If a dolphin were to go into a deep, full-brain, unconscious sleep, then they would simply suffocate or drown. Likewise, believers can't afford to be lulled to sleep by the world. We must remain alert, always ready for the Lord's return. Because if we're caught living in the world when Christ returns, that causes us to shrink back in shame because we've been given the power of the Holy Spirit to reject the world's temptations and lies. But we didn't tap into that. Our culture today is constantly throwing lies at us. And they're really easy to believe because they make great our own self-worth and make little of the power of God. They distort the truth of God because they feed our flesh, our eyes, and our pride. What worldly desires are you grasping onto? Do you find yourself stuck in a gourd because of your unwillingness to let go? Abiding in Christ's truth protects us from these things because we're fellowshipping with him and our eyes are fixed on him so that we're ready for him. Our fellowship with him should then extend out to fellowship with our brothers and sisters in the faith. This is such an important part of our Christian life because the Christian life is hard and God created the church to be a source of fellowship, of accountability, and of learning. 
If a believer is not engaging their vertical relationship with God and their horizontal relationship with other believers, then their, their Christian life will be anemic. They'll be missing an important piece of abiding in Christ. Brothers and sisters, are you anemic in your walk with God? Do you desire to know Christ but fail in your desire to fellowship with other Christians? Is your schedule too busy? Or are there other priorities that take precedence? Perhaps you're stuck in a gourd that is keeping you from experiencing the fruit of abiding. By abiding in Christ, we fellowship with him and discern what is true and what is false through the Holy Spirit. And as we grow in him, we grow in our fellowship with other brothers and sisters as we await Christ's return. This is how we prepare for the coming of Jesus. This is how we keep from believing the lies and hold fast to the truth. This is how we keep from loving the desires of the world. And this is how we abide in Christ. Let's pray that we abide in Christ together. Please join me in prayer. God, thank you for your son. Thank you for his sacrifice to us, for us, so that we no longer will incur your wrath, but we can be in fellowship with you. God, we ask that you please give us the power through your spirit to abide in you and reject what the world is trying to lure us in with and help us as we prepare and we wait for your return to abide in you and with one another in you. And Lord, we ask that you not tarry, but that you come, bring your people to you so that we may worship you forever. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I invite you to stand with us as we end by singing of Christ's return and our longing for it.
Father, we are so grateful for the spheres of influences you've given us, relationships. And knowing that, Father, we pray, give us one more hour, one more day, one more year, that we may be able to share who you are. And at the same time, we pray, even so come, Lord Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.